the number one goal of the Hunts Point Produce Market is to provide the tri-state area with some of the freshest produce anywhere. There's something else that is close to our heart, and that's giving back to our community. And who better to tell us about it than Myra Gordon, the market's executive director for nearly 25 years. She's as proud and passionate about the produce as she is about the people that the market helps, no matter what their age. Children that live in urban areas have a built-in misconception about where the food comes from. <laughs> for the people to understand where the produce comes from, when it ends up in their local supermarket or bodega or bodega independent food store. We at Hunts Point have always felt that we need to be good neighbors. We need to give back to this community. In October 2012, Hunts Point Produce gave out more than 100,000 pounds of fresh produce to the victims of Hurricane Sandy in New York City. I think it's very important for the viewers at large to understand the good that this market does. We employ people from the local neighborhood, and these are good paying union jobs. We treat our health well. They never leave us once they're here. And I think in general, the people that work in here are very cognizant of always doing the right thing. Hunts Point Produce also supports the Police Athletic League, multiple charities, health fairs, and eating healthy in local New York City public schools. We actually adopted a school this year, the Hyde Charter School. The Hyde Charter School comes to Hunts Point once a week and picks up enough produce for a class break or dessert. For them to understand the need to remain healthy begins at an early age. And as they get older, the fact that they have ingested produce in particular, uh, loaded with antioxidants, uh, can only benefit them in life. And when they are taught these things in their youth, they generally follow it through into adulthood. I think that now I can eat healthier. These children were bright-eyed and enthusiastic and wanting to learn and taking it all in and absorbing it. Their questions were sophisticated. Uh, you have to keep in mind that the group we had in here today were just turning 12 years old. questions having to do with transportation, eating healthy, wanting to know the kinds of produce they were looking at that they'd never seen before, and wanting to know about what we sell in here, how much money is being sold in here. The entire experience for this particular group was very rewarding and truly educational. This is an epic place. You need to come here because crew, we thank you for joining us. We hope a little of what we showed you today will keep you coming back week after week. Thank you, everyone. Yes. You guys can come on. Good morning, everyone. I want to thank you for coming to our Food Policy for Breakfast seminar series. I want to welcome you to Hunter College. My name is Charles Plackett, and I'm the director of the New York City Food Policy Center and a professor here at Hunter College. We have a very exciting panel discussion planned for you this morning. I've always been fascinated by Hunts Point Food Distribution Center, which I finally learned exactly what the name is, uh, including the produce, fish, and meat markets, um, and thought it would be a very interesting seminar. I'm pleased to welcome Julie Stein from the New York City Economic Development Corporation, Myra Gordon from Hunts Point Produce Market, Kate McKenzie from City Harvest, 
Ben Mosner from the Mosner Family Brands, and Stephanie Katzman from Katzman Produce. Um, just you know, one quick story. I when you know, I wanted to learn more about the market, and, and um, one of the first calls was to, to Myra uh, Gordon, and I said, "Oh, we we have these food policy for breakfast seminars." And we started at 8.30. She goes, I'm sorry, I can't come. <laughs> so I said, well, what time can you come? She says, I couldn't come till 9.30. I said, well, that's the time of the event for Matt. <laughs> so it was really an honor for, for everybody to come, but you know, specifically for her, because I know uh, it's, it's not easy to get here running that, that whole market. Um, that said, I'd like to call up uh, Julie Stein, who will give an overview about the Hunts Point food distribution market. Julie Stein, I'm a Vice President at the New York City Economic Development Corporation, and I wanted to thank Charles for in, uh, inviting me and inviting the panelists here today to talk about a very important city asset, um, both for uh, the South Bronx and also for the city um, food uh, supply entirely. Um, so just to give a little uh, background on Hunts Point, to give context to the panel discussion today, I can give an overview of um, what EDC does um, at the markets and a little bit of a preview of all the markets, and then I'll let the panelists um, dive into details on their own market. Um, but just to put in context for a second, the Food Distribution Center, which is what you see here on the right, is um, city-owned land. It's about a third of the Hunts Point Peninsula. But the Hunts Point Peninsula is also um, heavily industrial with other uses, other food uses, other auto uses, and other types of industrial uses, and there's also a residential core of about 12,500 people. So it's a, it's a mixed-use neighborhood with a number of um, issues related to the fact that there are these two somewhat conflicting uses in close proximity to one another. To zoom in on the food distribution center itself, uh, it's a 329-acre campus. It's comprised of um, a number of different tenants, which I'll go into in a second. It's over 100 firms and um, about 8,400 employees. So it's the most, um, industri most uh, industrialized use in the Bronx, a very important job center for us and a very important economic driver for the entire city. Um, also worth noting that many of the jobs, most of the jobs uh, in the meat produce and fish market are all union jobs, so they're really good employers, and I'm sure that Ben and Myra will speak to this as well. Um, I have a couple of photos up here, but more photos to come uh, later in the presentation. Um, I also want to mention that uh, this was a center that was built starting in the late 1960s as part of a national trend to centralize terminal markets um, from what had previously been more um, decentralized distributed markets throughout the city um, and throughout cities all over the country. This has to do with um, improvements in refrigeration technology and, and transportation technology that made having these terminal, centralized terminal markets um, throughout many major U.S. cities, really critical part of the supply chain. Um, you will see in other cities that most of those terminal markets have gone away. Um, New York City is very unique for a lot of reasons. I know we say that all the time, but in, in terms of the food supply, it, it's particularly true. We have a lot of really um, unique needs, particularly on the retail side, in terms of the small footprints that we have and the small supermarkets that we have, and that really drives the need uh, and the ability for the terminal market to survive and continue to serve um, the people in New York City. Um, and so the produce and meat markets were both built uh, or in that original move, uh, both in the, in the late 60s and early 70s. The fish market was uh, built in 2005 and when the uh, move from Fulton Street on, um, on South Street in Manhattan. Just to quickly touch on why I'm standing up here. So m most people ask, why, why is EDC involved in uh, Hunts Point at all? We're, uh, we're involved in a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, we are the lease administrators uh, for the property on behalf of the city of New York. It's small business service property. We manage uh, the property. We manage the leases. Um, but we have leases with the three cooperatives who then have subleases with all of their tenants. So we don't directly manage the markets. The, the cooperatives do. And then we also have a couple other tenants, which I'll talk about. We also provide maintenance um, for for the larger campus, uh, the, the Food Center Drive, 
Um, we've also been involved in Hunts Point uh, since 2003 on the um, sort of stakeholder engagement side, starting with the Hunts Point Vision Plan, which was an effort with local elected officials, community groups, businesses, um, to really figure out how to take these uh, multiple uses that coexist in this peninsula and figure out a way to make them live and be better neighbors to each other. We've been, uh, EDC has been implementing projects out of that plan over the last decade. Um, some of the things that uh, you'll see photos of later are the South Bronx Greenway, some vacant land development, um, and alternative fuel station, which we're developing. Uh, we continue to meet with the Vision Plan Task Force uh, twice a year to give updates, and it's a great, um, we really built relationships there that uh, both pay dividends sort of in the projects that we work on, but also in terms of folks who are on the ground every day and have to work uh, together with each other. Um, and the last thing that we do is, of course, strategic planning for the campus, which I'll go into in more detail. Um, so to go over the tenants uh, that we have in Hunts Point, most people, when they think of Hunts Point, they think of just the produce market. Um, and no offense, Mark, it's much more than just the produce market. The produce market is critical, and I'm sure we'll talk more around today. Um, but, but, but it is important to note that those 8,400 jobs that I spoke of are um, you know, distributed throughout the three um, Tenants that are highlighted here, the produce, meat, and fish market, those are the cooperative public markets. They're the wholesale markets that I was speaking of, but I also want to highlight that there are six other private tenants that uh, are in standalone buildings that are also um, big, important players at Baldor, Chef's Warehouse, Crasdale, and Heiser Bush, which you're probably familiar with, um, Citarella, and Sultana. And together, it comprises uh, over 3 million square feet of industrial food use, which is pretty incredible, and again, 8,400 jobs. Um, I'm going to flip through a couple of quickly some photos of the different properties. So the produce market is the most visually appealing, um, I, I found, based on experience. Um, it, we, just, this is just some examples of some of the products that are sold there, and as Myra will tell you, products come from all over the world and also uh, you know, locally in New York State. Um, and in terms of the facility, I also just wanted to highlight um, that in the, you can see in the upper right-hand corner, the um, critical part about the market is these, into these exterior shopping streets. Um, the, the, the way that we keep our food prices low in New York is by having um, the ability to comparison shop for fresh food. And so having these exterior streets allows shoppers to go up and down, compare what's available, compare the prices, and, and haggle for the best prices. Um, I also wanted to note on the bottom right is a there's also processing and sorting that happens on site. Again, very job intensive uses. This is a tomato sorting facility, which um, if you ever have the opportunity to take a tour, is one of the highlights of the, of the tour. Um, on the meat market, um, I've found through experience people don't love looking at pictures of raw meat in case there's any vegetarians in the room. So I held a little light on the product, but I did want to highlight in the photos, um, there are um, at the meat market two different types of facilities, and I'm sure Ben will talk about this more later. Um, but the original facilities that were built are the ones that are on the left-hand side, and the bottom left-hand photo is a picture um, actually of Ben's um, facility. And the, the buildings were built originally in the early 70s to be able to accept meat that came on carcasses on rails. Um, the meat was shipped whole, it came, there was butchering on site. Um, some of the vendors still do that, um, but a lot of them have moved to boxes because over time um, the meat packers have realized that it's not necessarily worth shipping the bones and the fat, and they butcher it at the slaughterhouse, and then they send it in boxes. Unfortunately, the buildings, uh, like you see on the left, like what Ben's in right now, is not great for storing boxes because the ceilings are low and they have these rails. The newest building was built about 10 years ago, um, and there's only one of those buildings out of the six or seven on site. That one has tall ceilings. It's much more consistent with modern industrial uses. And as you can see um, on the bottom left hand, the bottom right hand side, you can stack boxes really tall. And so as we think about what modernization looks like for the meat market, um, there will you know still be some folks who do specialty butchering and have the need for stuff that comes in on rails. But there's also a tremendous need to modernize and bring in taller ceilings so that they can do more distribution and stacking of boxes. Um, and on the fish market, the fish market is the newest facility. Um, it was uh, came, like I said, in 2005. Um, the um, I just want to highlight here also on the bottom left uh, the internal street at the fish market. There's also comparison shopping, just like at the produce market, to find the freshest, best priced um, fish that you can get. About 90% of the fish in the in the fish market is fresh. If only about 10% is frozen, and that's just to highlight that you know, most people eat about a mix of 50-50 frozen fresh, so this really is a competitive advantage of the fish market is their fresh fish. Um, they also do a bunch of um, processing and filleting, as you can see in the photo on the upper right hand side, um, and uh, it's, uh, this is also one of my, all, all of these are my favorite tours. That's what I'll say. <laughs> 
Um, so uh, Charles wanted me to speak a little bit about what um, the city's doing in terms of strategic planning for the markets and for the campus. And when we think about what our vision for Hunts Point is, we really think of four key words. One is modern, resilient, um, diverse, and job intensive. And so when we think about um, you know, what, what we are seeking for the center, it's a, it's a food center that is competitive and viable now and into the future, and one that has economic implication, economic development implications for the cluster itself, for the South Bronx as a whole, and also that secures our food distribution center for the food supply citywide. Um, and we achieved this vision through three different types of investments. One is in modernization, one in resiliency, and one in transportation. And we have about $270 million worth of investments that are either in the ground or being planned right now across those three categories. Um, in terms of modernization, uh, last March, the mayor announced a $150 million investment in modernization for Hunts Point, and thinking about the types of um, improvements that I just spoke around the meat market, similar concerns around the produce market as well. Um, I can't go into a lot of detail on the particulars because they're all subject to negotiations with our tenants, um, but they're, we're really excited about the opportunity to invest in these facilities to make them more viable um, and more competitive. Um, I also want to highlight recent investments that have been made by the private tenant. So um, Balder, who I know is in the room today, um, is in the process of doing a $28 million expansion project to add um, over 100,000 square feet to their existing facility, making their Bronx location their, head, their corporate headquarters, which we're really excited about, expanding their um, fresh cuts operation and, and bringing 350 new jobs over eight years. Um, Chef's Warehouse Dairyland is also uh, about to finish up a $20 million uh, investment in, in an expansion of their facility. So there's a lot of both public and private investment going into the food center now, um, some of which you can see, some of which you will be able to see over the next five to ten years. On the resiliency front, um, when it comes to Hurricane Sandy, we really lucked out in Hunts Point. If the storm had hit uh, several hours earlier or later, we would have been in a really different situation, but it was low tide in the Long Island Sound and in the East River and uh, up in the South Bronx, so we lucked out. Um, but it was an opportunity for us to really think seriously about what the threats are um, to the food center and to our food supply chain generally, and it's been an opportunity for us to, to do strategic planning in that area. The threats um, are related to water and to sea level rise and storm surge, but we also know that there's other types of threats that we have uh, related to precipitation, extreme heat events, um, and also just infrastructure outages. Um, some of you may be familiar with the Rebuild by Design competition. Um, a, tr a really tremendous effort went in um, from a, third, a set of third-party uh, consultants and community members to put together this visionary plan for resiliency in Hunts Point. The federal government awarded the city um, 25, $20 million to implement that plan, and we've added another 25. So we have a bucket of $45 million right now to do a resiliency pilot project and to advance other um, ideas that were in that initial rebuild by design proposal. So we are um, about to start uh, next month a, a massive set of feasibility studies around energy resiliency and flood risk reduction for Hunts Point, um, working both with the community and with the businesses and thinking about how we can come up with interventions that benefit both the businesses and the community. Um, and we're really excited about kicking that off. I also want to highlight that this really builds on our Hunts Point vision plan work and all of the stakeholder engagement that we have been doing over the last decade to be able to um, really bring folks together, ask them to take off their individual um, interest hats and really think broadly about uh, communal goals and goals um, for the peninsula. Um, and we are thinking about how to integrate all the technical analysis that's coming out of the feasibility studies into that engagement so that there's a high level of participation in the entire process. Um, and then the last thing that I just wanted to highlight is recent infrastructure investments that we've made in transportation. Um, this project Myra would be familiar with, it's a $22, $22 million um, investment in rail at the produce market. About 3% of the produce market's um, supply comes in now by rail. We think it could be up to 6%. And we know that by being able to invest in rail, we help keep trucks off the road. It helps with some of the asthma issues in the community. Um, and so we are doing this work now. We're also doing work to the lead track that comes into um, the, the facility. And so we're making a number of investments around rail. And then the last thing I want to highlight is a number of other uh, transportation investments that have environmental justice uh, benefits. Number one, the South Bronx Greenway, which was a plan that came out of the vision plan, um, it has just been implemented over the last two years. We um, just unveiled the um, food center drive, uh, it's the first class one 
Class A, Class 1, bike lane in the Bronx. And it, it's, a, it's a separate bike lane that allows folks to access um, Hunts Point Landing, which is uh, a new publicly accessible open space that you can see just built on the peninsula. And then the picture on the lower right-hand side is an alternative fuel station that um, will, will hopefully go into construction within the year, which will allow um, our tenants to convert into um, more fuel efficient um, alternative fuel vehicles um, and be able to, again, bring down, um, help bring down asthma rates in so that was a really quick tour, I didn't have very much time. Um, but I just wanted to give you a summary of sort of all the work that we're doing um, and give a sort of summary of all the things that are happening up there. Um, so thank you. <laughs> five times, not to shut the main lights out. Uh, thank you so, thank you so much. Uh, what I, what I'd like to do now is um, starting uh, with Stephanie. If you could just uh, come in uh, left to right. If you could just give us a little bit, of, uh, tell us sort of a minute or two about uh, your relationship to Hunts Point and what you do and some some interesting things about. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Stephanie Katzman. I work in the Hunts Point Produce Market. Uh, we have two companies in there, um, S. Katzman Produce and Katzman Berry Corp. I am fourth generation in the business. Uh, my father is still running things. I'm making my way throughout the company. Um, I've worked in each position so far, and I'm up in senior management now, uh, learning how to run the show. Our business, um, I like to say, is very simple. It's page one of your economic textbooks. It's supply and demand. Um, weather controls a lot of our business um, in the growing areas and in the selling areas. And based on supply, uh, we set our price points. And as long as we sell for a fair price and pay our farmers back a fair price, um, everybody makes money. Um, so we always say it's more of a partnership and a vendor-customer relationship that we have with both our farmers and our customers. Um, our customer base ranges from small mom and pop stores, um, food service companies, bodegas in the city. Um, we sell purveyors who deal with restaurants, and we also sell the big chain stores like Whole Foods, Stop and Shop, ShopRite. Um, so we kind of run the full gamut. Anyone is um, welcome into the produce market to buy. Uh, we sell by the box as opposed to by the piece. Um, but anyone can come in and walk right up and buy on any day of the week. Good morning, my name is Ben Mosner of Mosner Family Brands, and we're located in the Hunts Point Cooperative Meat Market, which is, uh, besides the uh, produce market, which everybody knows, we're the other market, apparently. <laughs> so our company began, um, uh, we're third generation. My grandfather, David Moser, started the company uh, when he came back from World War II. And uh, his uncle was in the meat business, and he got a job uh, as a meat salesman. And uh, at some point, he asked for a raise, uh, $5 a week, and they denied his raise. So the next day, he went out and asked his father-in-law to borrow some money. He got $300 and bought himself a used station wagon. Uh, from that station wagon, he went out and he was able to develop a business uh, clientele that got big enough that he went to rent one rail uh, in, on the Brook Avenue market. This is all prior to the Hunts Point Cooperative Markets uh, being built. Uh, when the Hunts Point Cooperative Market was built, we were one of the original tenants, and there's uh, still um, only but a few of us left. Uh, we started as a veal company, and that's back when veal consumption was, was much higher. Uh, we added lamb to the mix uh, back in the mid-80s, uh, and, fr and from there, as we got into the early 2000s, we became the um, uh, first company to be a certified humane uh, in regards to our veal program. Uh, that's, that's by the uh, Humane Farm Animal Care Center out of Virginia. Um, but what happened from that point is that uh, we were selling to a company by the name of Fresh Fields, uh, which was a Connecticut-based company, uh, then was shortly after uh, purchased by Whole Foods Market. 
Uh, Whole Foods uh, loved our program, realized they needed to uh, make a, a change to upgrade their veal uh, to, to fit their model. And so from that point, uh, we've gone on and uh, have a great relationship, especially with Whole Foods, uh, that we've gone out and developed several locally raised programs. Um, because of their standards, these programs um, are all, you know, uh, GAP approved, um, which is the Global Animal Partnership, which leads us to uh, pasture centered and, uh, you know, animal welfare, you know, uh, high, high levels of animal welfare. Uh, which got us, you know, as a third generation going and uh, with our mother being a nutritionist, we decided that we were going to really get into uh, the wellness meats. So um, everything that we do at this point uh, and everything we do going forward is really wellness centered, uh, grass fed, non-GMO project verified as much as possible. Um, is certainly pasture centered and we continue to build out our local programs uh, while understanding some of the programs we have to bring from a little further away because it's just not uh, feasible to raise certain animals in the, this immediate area. But uh, that's a little bit about our company. The one thing that I do want to mention besides that is that I do sit on the executive board of the Hunts Point Cooperative Market and uh, all statements uh, and opinions of mine today are from Mozart Family Brands. Uh, so I just wanted to make that note, thank you. Kate? Thanks. Uh, my name is Kate McKenzie and I'm with City Harvest. Um, City Harvest rescues 55 million pounds of food this year and about two million pounds of that um, comes from the Hunts Point produce market. Um, we have been rescuing food from the market um, for as we I was emailing with, with staff today for as long as anybody can remember and likely back to um, to our origins um, just shy of 33 years ago. Um, I uh, we take this food and deliver it to uh, soup kitchens and food pantries across New York City. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about um, the logistics involved with that when we get into the, the actual panel components. But um, of the 500 programs that we distribute to, about 100 of them are in the Bronx, and the uh, food that we rescue from Hunts Point goes directly to those agencies. Um, so I look forward to telling you a bit more about that. Great, thank you. Uh, you sort of heard a great deal about us. Uh, we are, as uh, Julie indicated, uh, the largest of the tenants uh, that EDC oversees as our overlord. Uh, we sit on 112.5 acres. Uh, we are 35 companies uh, and has also been stated being in competition with one another, and I think Steffi said it well, uh, the price points are kept competitive which enables the independent greengrocer or the corner store or the bodega or the bodeguera to come in to our market and buy at a price point that they can then go back to their communities and sell the produce at prices that are affordable. If there were standalone companies throughout the city, that competitive aspect would not exist. I know there's been some concern that what happens because we're all in one area, if we are not able to open, what happens to the food supply? And there is enough food coming from other areas that would not negatively impact the city. But just as an aside, in all the years that I'm there, and I'm there for almost 30 years, uh, I think we've closed for a period of 12 hours once or twice. We've always managed to stay open regardless of the weather. And as Julie said, we were not impacted by Hurricane Sandy. Uh, we are a night industry. Why are we a night industry? We're a night industry because in order to get the food into the individual stores, whether it's being delivered or picked up, it needs to be done at night when the store shelves can be loaded so that when the customer is ready to come into shop at 6 or 7 o'clock in the morning, the food is there, available, and fresh. And one of the reasons why many of the customers come in on a daily basis is because you don't make money off of your refrigerator. You make money off of your shelf space, or if you're a restaurant, you make money off of the number of times you can turn a table, but not, again, from your refrigeration. Uh, anything grown anywhere in the world <coughs> finds our way into our market. We get our product from 49 states in the United States, nothing from Alaska. <laughs> we get our food from 55 foreign countries. 
Uh, why? Because New York is a very sophisticated eating population. And what people see and eat in restaurants, they very much want to make at home. And we have become something of a foodie generation. Therefore, the degree of specialty items, which Stephanie can talk about if she wants to later, uh, have begun to play a much larger part in the market. Also, I think it's a fact that you might want to know, we don't handle the actual item. Everything comes in in a sealed box. The way it comes in is the way it goes out. We don't touch the product. So if there's a problem with the product, although we do have product liability, it generally is not generated from something within the market. It's generated somewhere along the packing line or in the fields, having nothing at all to us. What we sell to you is probably the best of what's available any place in the United States or any place in the world. Uh, as Julie also said, uh, the wages in our market are good. We're well above the new uh, base wage, which at some point in New York will be $15 an hour. Uh, we are a union shop. We're the United Brotherhood of Teamsters Local 202. And the women or, and the men that work upstairs are Local 153. And for the cooperative itself, the Public Safety Division, uh, New York City Peace Officers, many of them are armed, uh, are also PBA, that is a small union. Uh, all of your police throughout the city are Police Benevolent Association members. So I think rather than having any of us just sit here and chat, there probably are questions from the audience that one of us or all of us could answer. Hands? I have, I have questions for you, and then we'll do it. Okay. Go ahead. I want to get my question in first. <laughs> so, so with that said, is that also true of the uh, meat and fish markets? The same uh, that they're unionized, and and um, and I know that you may not be able to answer, but is that? Uh, yeah, the, uh, there the meat market uh, generally has. Uh, I, I believe it's just two unions. Uh, there's the uh, local uh, three seventy. 342, uh, which which we're members of, which is the uh, Meat Meat Cutters Association, and then there's also the uh, uh, Teamsters 202, which uh, uh, work with the companies that just do the straight distribution. Thank you. So I, my first question is um, for Julie and also the panel, but the internet. Suppose, you talked about this. You, well, you talked about pretty strongly about the resiliency and, and the feasibility study, but. The idea is that the internet supposed is designed so that there's no central hub, so it can't be taken down. And I, and I wonder two things. Based on this feasibility study that you're going to do, multiple feasibility studies, what's your, your, what's your, if you can offer your opinion as to the real resiliency right now, and what if the feasibilities come back and say and, and talk about incredible vulnerabilities? Is there going to be transparency? Um, is that something that will be hidden? Uh, you know, just what would that look like? Well, it, it'll, it'll be very transparent. I think, you know, we're broadly aware of what the threats are and what the vulnerabilities are. I think it's more the feasibility studies, you know, we will be doing a, a risk and vulnerability assessment to make sure that we're you know, designing for the right threats, but we are, you know, we're, we're broadly aware of some of the challenges and there'll be, you know, very participatory, participatory process in terms of figuring out what the investments are going to go towards. Um, the way that we think about, you know, our investments at Hunts Point is, the question is really how do we take advantage of the competitive advantages of Hunts Point without um, con unnecessarily concentrating risk. So I, I think what I'd actually like to do is turn it over to Ben and Myra to talk a little bit about some of the functions of the terminal market and how the break bulk function happens and sort of like what role the markets play from a national distribution perspective because the it's, it's not like we could just have multiple markets all over the city. There's a, a sort of a, a economies of scale that has to happen at the terminal market that really impact the rest of the supply chain. Um, and so when we think about the resiliency, there are a lot of other ways that food does get into the city, but the specific function that the markets play it is very, very specific in terms of the roles and the parts of the supply chain that it serves. So I don't know if Myra, you want to talk a little bit about how food sort of comes into your market as a first touch point into the city, um, because it's something that's difficult to um, replicate in sort of a, a more miniature way because of that economy of scale. Well, when you talk about 55 foreign countries and 49 states in the United States, obviously produce is not walking its way into the market. We get our product by rail, uh, and as uh, was alluded to, it's about 3%. We were originally built as a rail terminal. 
but when the rails began to have difficulty delivering on a timely basis and with the ability of intermodal transportation, uh, uh, trailers and trucks coming from across the country also began to deliver the majority of our produce. But we also get produce by boat because so much of it comes in from other parts of the world. Uh, we get produce in by plane as well. Uh, if you were to walk the market, you would see what we call an LD3 container, uh, which rides in the uh, hold of a ship. Uh, bananas, for example, come in what we call break bulk and usually take the entire boat of bananas and they dock. Uh, and actually, we have brand new banana ripening rooms in the market, something else that we do. So we have truck, trailer, plane, train, and boat is the way we have a transportation network to make sure that there is always availability of food growing from some place in the world during some season. We've become dependent on having everything all the time. Uh, when I was growing up, we only had tomatoes and watermelon in the summer, the same with corn. And now you can get everything 365 days a year because the consumer has gotten used to it and wants it that way. So we are able to source and bring in product from wherever it's being grown, no matter what time of the year that it is. Yeah, and from a meat market perspective, uh, we're 693,000 square feet of uh, refrigerated and freezer space, uh, which is a little bit different than the produce market. Um, so from a resiliency perspective uh, for our market, uh, yeah, we, we were very fortunate after Hurricane Sandy. Uh, I think the water came halfway across Food Center Drive, but by the uh, grace of God, uh, it didn't pass over to the market. Uh, most of our uh, infrastructure is underground, uh, so that could have shut down the market for uh, an unknown period of, uh, period of time. Uh, but I guess that was a, a good warning sign and it got the ball rolling. Uh, you know, the EDC, uh, as Julie mentioned, is uh, working on resiliency programs for the market. Um, I'm very, very happy to say that the uh, City Council approved yesterday. Uh, we got the, the, the big old check for uh, $3.45 million for backup generators which the market did not have or does not have currently. So when there's an electrical outage, uh, which has happened uh, when there was the big outage on the East Coast 15 years ago or so, and it's happened one time since then, uh, we just have to keep our doors shut and hope refrigeration lasts as long as possible. But otherwise, there was really no answer to that. And the fact that the market probably has upwards of a, a hundred million dollars worth of product at any given time, uh, and that fact that the refrigeration is key, uh, having that backup power just being granted uh, to us by the city council in and of itself uh, is huge. Um, as far as uh, you know, I mean, th there's other concerns. Uh, you know. And, and, I, and I think that it's, it's really interesting, the, the question that you brought up, but I mean, certainly, you know, from terrorism perspectives, which you know happens, uh, it'll never happen here, you know, kind, kind of mentality, and, and, and you, just, you just don't know. Um, but the, these are all things that we're gonna have to take a real hard look at, you know, going forward. Uh, but as far as, you know, this, you know, I mean, the internet, yeah, there's no central hub. It's a little, you know, you, yeah, you could run the internet from your house. But you know the the reality is is that there's as Myra said there's economies of scale uh, that allow us to bring product at the best price point that we possibly can. Otherwise, everybody sitting here would be looking at much higher priced uh, food uh, in general. When we know that people are already stretching themselves uh, to cover their food bill on on a weekly or monthly basis. So the economies of scale of that central market make it work very much worthwhile. Uh, for for everybody through the New York City and, and greater area. The one other thing I'll add is that we are currently working with um, the produce market and we will be working with the other markets to update their continuity of operations planning, which is um, looking at how you, you know what their different plans are for different types of emergencies. Um, the produce market has one in place and we're just making sure that they're now coordinated with the Office of Emergency Management and um, our, our operations system as well. Um, so thinking just about how we integrate all of our plans together to make sure, sure that we're coordinated. Thank you. Um, and, and Kate, I just moving to City Harvest and Emergency Food Rescue. So right now you're, and you, I'm making sure I'm getting this right, you're at uh, two million pounds in three days a week. Yeah. And, and 
Is that capacity, or is there room for more uh, emergency food, food rescue from, from, the, mm -hmm. from the market? So or? one of the reasons why I want to spend a few minutes talking about the network um, is this comes up as you know another big um, and deserving trend right now is the attention on food waste or wasted food. And um, often what, what we find, and, and I think that the gap in the conversation across the country right now is that it's not just about quantifying the amount of, of food, that the potential for food rescue or food distribution, but particularly, and I'll you know, talk about the, the sites and the, the food programs in the Bronx, we have to make sure that the food is going to locations where they can, they can take it. And so if we think about, um, Elliot is the gentleman that, that rescues food at Hunts Point, um, gets there at 5.30 in the morning. Um, he will fill a whole tractor trailer load full of food, but then it's making sure that that food, which the reason why people like Stephanie and many others can donate to City Harvest, is this food isn't necessarily taken by some of the bodegas or other stores. It's still really great, but um, you know, it might have a life of maybe two days a day, maybe a bit more. It's still very, very high quality, but we need to then make sure that the soup kitchens or food pantries can serve it that night or, or the next morning. And so if you're not familiar with the way that soup kitchens or food pantries work, they have um, a very, I don't want to call it irregular, but not necessarily consistent hours. So it's not, it's not you know, Monday through Friday, nine to five kind of operation. It might be um, Tuesdays, Thursdays for lunch and then maybe for dinner. Or maybe it is open nine to five or eight to eight, um, but they don't have a, a huge um, storage capability. And by storage, it could be refrigeration or it could be um, shelf space. So it's making sure that the capacity of the emergency food providers is met by the types of food that we're bringing in. So I think that the, the answer to your question is that we could probably find more food um, uh, at, at, the, at the market, but make it, we want to make sure that that food is getting into the bellies of hungry New Yorkers. And so that, the logistics involved in that is somewhat complicated. I will say, Elliot wanted me to make a, a point that um, the challenge for him is sometimes, as you, said, you saw the pictures and Julie mentioned the exterior streets, sometimes it's just finding a spot to pull into. And thanks to Myra who can help us out with that a bit, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a hot commodity, those spaces, and we're pulling, we're talking about pulling pallets around. So just literally getting the pallets onto our trucks um, when you've got buyers who clearly are going to take the priority and should, um, that can be logistically challenging um, as well. And, and, and forgive me if this is naive, but what, what about fish and meat? Um, it's not naive at all. Um, I think that, again, it was fantastic to see the pictures too and to think about, it made me hungry to think about um, all that fresh fish um, and also the meat, because I do eat meat. But um, we, we can handle frozen food. We, we, can, we don't have the license um, or the ability to manage uh, fresh um, uh, raw fish or raw, um, raw meats. Um, what we do have, in fact, we're in the midst of sort of this chicken emergency right now because we receive tremendous amounts of frozen meat, um, not necessarily from, from, um, from the meat market, um, but from other vendors. Um, and so we have a freezer, but again, we're going, the reason why it's a, a little bit of a nightmare for us right now is because we have to match that with the uh, emergency <coughs> food providers who have freezer space right now that can take some of these chickens. So it's, um, you know, it's all logistics, I and mean, yes, there's a bit of supply and demand involved, but the, the supply, the, um, the demand, of course, people need food, but we have to make sure that the infrastructure and the capacity is there to safely take on that food. Um, but we have a strong focus at City Harvest on all, you know, definitely fresh produce and definitely um, high quality nutrient dense foods like meats and fish. Is there a movement, and I'll open this to the panel, to, um, is, first of all, is there a lot of waste with the meat and fish market? And number two, is there talks about someone taking that capacity and I, distributing? I, I, I look forward to that answer, and I just want to clarify that there's, because this is a, a, a tough, it's just a, a, a ridiculous um, communications issue, right? There's like food, there's actual food waste, you know, the kinds of things that are scraps, that are the, you know, um, the peels from cucumbers and things like that, and food that really is rotten, let's say, but then there's really, really great food. And so there's a difference, right, between food waste and wasted food. 
um, and because I think that they both exist at, at the markets, um, but particularly when we talk about food that we're using, that we're rescuing to feed people, it's really great food. Yeah, I, I'd like to, to, uh, to answer that as well. Um, one of the large tenants in the Hunts Point meat market uh, is the food bank, uh, New York City Food Bank. So mo I would think that most donations from the meat market wind up going to the food bank as opposed to City Harvest. Um, I, I, I think that the market as a whole is, is, as a whole is, is extremely generous uh, to not only the food bank but also the local communities that come in, uh, community members. Um, you know, if, if they, you know, hundreds probably a year that want to do block parties or uh, something else of that nature, and you know, they usually get meat for free, uh, so we can uh, support the, the local communities in that, in that way as well. But again, I think City Harvest is, is an amazing organization. Uh, you know, but again, Food Bank being uh, one of the large tenants, I think that most of the meat products usually go that direction. Thank you. And Stephanie, I wanted to ask you, um, because Ben talked about some of the innovations um, uh, that he's done as a, you know, in uh, reaction to changing tastes in New York City, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, and then also I'd love to know how many each of you employ. Um, okay. So as far as changing tastes go, I'd say we kind of work with that by expanding our product line. Uh, when we started in the market, uh, back when it was built, we had about 10 different items that we sold, all really local greens, kale, collard, mustard, um, all mostly Jersey farmers. Uh, we dealt a little bit in some Florida avocados. Um, we've expanded since then. Uh, we now have our produce department, our berry department, our fruit department, and our specialty department, and we carry just over 2,000 SKUs. Um, Besides just expanding uh, the seasonality, as Myra mentioned before, that product is available year-round now where it used to just be seasonal. Uh, there's also other items that aren't grown here in the United States or even in Mexico or Canada that we used to get by truck before, and that's why a lot of stuff is coming in by boats. Um, my main example that I usually go to is a mango. Um, we bring in uh, containers, uh, I say containers, I mean boats. Uh, we bring in containers of mangoes um, year-round. Uh, from Brazil, Peru, Guatemala, um, out of Mexico. Um, mangoes don't grow here in the United States, but yet year-round, tons of different varieties are brought in all the time. So I think because of the large restaurant base and the diverse population just in Manhattan alone, where I believe there's about eight or nine million people, um, they're looking for the new best thing. So we have all these fancy chefs out there who want the uh, citron Buddha hand is usually a go-to for me, or even uh, the dragon fruit, which, not the best taste in the world, but looks amazing on a plate. So th things like, I, I, it tastes like a watered-down cucumber to me. Um, things like that. So it's not just taste appeal, it's also eye appeal. And I think the, the fanciness of the tri-state area uh, between New York and Connecticut and places like that really forced us to expand and go to what the customer wants. Um, and then as far as personnel goes, uh, we employ 375 people. I believe that's the largest um, in the market as far as employees go, not business-wise. Um, one of the main reasons uh, we do have more is we actually acquired space in the market as it became available. So we started with two units in the market right next to each other, and as different space around the market um, opened up, we purchased additional units, and we're up to 41. And because we're spread out around the market, we have to have um, more personnel. Thank you. Um, and my one, one last question, which is for the panel, but I think Julie might answer it best. How does, I, I know you explained it, but the New York City uh, Economic Development Corporation, so they, they manage the, lease, the leasing for the city of New York, right? So, and then you negotiate with the cooperatives. Is that how it works, or with each individual tenant? We have leases with um, each of the cooperatives, and then the cooperatives have subleases with their own tenants. And so we also have direct leases with those other six tenants that I mentioned, and we directly manage one of the buildings at 600 Food Center Drive. So, so when you negotiate with an entity, it would be with the cooperative? That's correct. Gotcha, okay. And just to give an idea, what, what, is, uh, what does square footage go for? And, and can anybody come in there, or...? And I, or, or is, do you have to buy into the cooperative? I guess this is for, for my or Ben. 
Uh, as I, I think I alluded to earlier, we are landlocked. Uh, we are fully occupied. Uh, most of the industry that exists today in the market uh, are, as Stephanie has said, and similar uh, to the meat market. Uh, we are a traditional family. We have one company that's in seven generation uh, of ownership. Most of the companies these days are into the fourth or fifth generation of ownership. Uh, separate management for each one of the uh, markets. Uh, I'm one of the two top managers in the produce market. And our leases are long leases. They don't get negotiated on a yearly or a bi-yearly basis. Our existing lease is a lease extension, if you will, and it's seven years long. And we are just about to start renegotiating with the city of New York for a lease going forward when the existing lease expires. But I'd, I'd like to allude to one more issue. I find that the terminology of the way in which we talk about food sometimes has a negative connotation. And the food that we donate is not really food waste. It is excess food. And I think it was well said when it was stated that the produce that we donate has a shelf life of one, two, possibly three days. You have to understand that the way in which the distribution centers around the city work, or the local stores possibly work, when produce is purchased, produce begins a dying process the minute it leaves its mother plant. It doesn't get better with age, the way we do, right? <laughs> so what happens is, it goes, if it's going to a DC or a distribution center, that's one stop after us. That's one day old, maybe two. It then goes into the back room of your local supermarket or chain store. And that could be another day or two. So now we're looking at produce before it even gets to the consumer to purchase, anywhere from two to four days old. And when you purchase it, you don't want to have just one day of shelf life left. You want to know that your fruit can last for four days or five days. And many of the items that are purchased these days because of alterations in the way seed is being developed, have a shelf life of 10 to 14 days. So what we give away is food that has a shortened shelf life and would not be able to go to a DC or the back room of a supermarket or a local green grocer and have you have the availability of taking it home and then having it last in your house for long enough so that you don't have to waste it. And that's where the waste may come in. But what we give away, we consider to be good produce, and it's excess produce. It's not necessarily food waste. Uh, you know what, Charlie? I'd like to actually answer that uh, You know, on behalf of, of the meat market to, to kind of speak to your question. Um, cur currently, our rent is about $22 per square foot. Uh, which, which sounds, you know, as, as an all-in, including, uh, you know, electric and, and uh, it, um, you know, maintenance of, of those units. Um, so that's really an all-in an all price, uh, which, which in and itself uh, seems not so bad. Uh, the, the challenge that we have are that the, um, the, uh, is that the market is so outdated. Uh, and it used to, it really was meant for, you know, uh, rail, you know, hanging, you know, animals to come in. Uh, that's really not the usage of the market or the better part of the market anymore. So uh, compared to, to newer state-of-the-art facilities, um, you, so for example, when we stack pallets, we can go too high. Uh, the, the newer facilities can go five high, six high. So when you talk about, you know, your, really the important, the important number to me is cubic feet. And so we're paying by the square foot, and by the square foot, it's, it sounds like it's not bad, but by cubic by cubic feet, uh, we're, we have we're, we're significantly more expensive than similar facilities that may be in Jersey or what have you, uh, and that that's the truth. By the way, we employ 50. Um, the reason why we don't employ more is because we're out of room, completely out of space. And because also a good problem is we're also 100% occupied as a market, so you almost have to hope your neighbor goes out of business in order to get more space. Uh, so, so our overflow uh, does go to Jersey as well, and so we have um, what we use is co-packers, so we don't employ them directly, but we use a, and we have a lot of space in Jersey that we use as well. Thank you. So this is actually perfect uh, segue because. One of my questions, my, so I ran a teeny tiny uh, aggregation distribution center in North Carolina, and one of the first things I noticed was that um, it's a really dirty business, 
meaning energy, water, it's just, it's super low mar margin, but also super expensive to run, and there's, you know, you, everybody's taking a cut of your 35% or whatever you get. So I guess my question, though, is back to, I don't know if this, who this is for, for the whole panel, is are you seeing a move towards more sort of greening in, um, in this supply chain, particularly in materials and packaging, refrigeration, and also regulation? You know, sort of the, in the building industry, we saw lead certification and requirements. So I'm curious if, if this is impacting you as you guys modernize. I mean, certainly what I'll say is that when we think about modern buildings, we obviously think about much more efficient buildings and looking at much more efficient energy systems in particular. Um, there's correlation, obviously, between energy efficiency and cost, and so there's an incentive for energy efficiency. Um, but on the supply side, I'll turn it over to one of these guys to answer. Um, I can't speak for the whole market. Uh, Myra can probably speak a little bit more about that. Actually, I believe the lights are one thing that they are doing. Um, but from a company standpoint, um, we s do see it coming. It does change our business. Um, sometimes for the better, sometimes, I don't want to say worse, but for the more expensive. But um, we've done things. Uh, we switched over all of the lights in our facility over to LEDs probably about five years ago now. Um, we saw cost savings there, also a savings in electric. Uh, we looked into a uh, generator company um, that'll set up generators on the roof of the building. Uh, we're still in the process of looking into this. And it'll run our entire facility, and any excess energy actually gets uh, sold back to Con Edison. So hopefully that one might even turn into a money-saving plus money-making deal. Uh, we are also um, part of the Green Challenge. I'm not 100% sure of the name there, uh, but it's something we do with our waste. So we actually have probably about seven or eight different colored garbage pails throughout our entire facility now and all of our waste is separated into the seven or eight different categories that are out there and uh, we have a full recycling program um, we separate out the organic waste and we have it set up with um, our garbage company that they take it and they bring it uh, where it is uh, wherever it needs to go um, we've seen a lot on the supply chain side of things with truck regulations so um, a lot was driven by some regulations put in place by California, where a lot of uh, fruit and produce is grown. Um, about, I want to say probably about six or seven years ago now, they made some new requirements um, that the refrigeration units on the trucks had to um, pass some new testing. Um, they put a lot of companies out of business if they weren't able to upgrade their units. Um, I know inside Hunts Point Produce Market, um, there's a three-second idling rule. So you're not allowed to have your trucks on, or three seconds, I'm sorry, three minute idling rule. Uh, you're not allowed to have your trucks on for longer than three minutes, so I know they cut down on a lot of the fumes and uh, around the market as well. And from, and from the meat market uh, perspective, um, you know, so, some of the things that we've looked at, we also did the lighting, which had a payback of just a couple years. Uh, one of our, our single greatest expense in the market is our electricity, because that market's running 24-7, 365, which is better than your 12 minutes off, Myra. 24-7, uh, 365, and our energy costs are exorbitant. You couldn't even imagine. Uh, I, I don't, you know, this is market business, so I don't want to talk about that specifically, but it's incredible. Uh, one of the things, though, that we're doing is, uh, you know, I think the city, we keep talking with the EDC about maybe having, uh, whether it's cogen or a micro grid that could service the entire area and bring our uh, energy costs way down. And we've also worked uh, on, uh, we, we tried to do a, a solar panel project. The challenge is, is that so much of the market currently has uh, 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 rooftop units for refrigeration and freezers that it just really wasn't feasible, even though we really uh, wanted to do it. The other thing that's coming to the peninsula as well, perhaps, is the natural fueling, uh, natural gas fuel station, uh, which will have a big impact uh, as well on, uh, on the environment in a beneficial way. As part of those um, resiliency feasibility studies, one of the things we will be looking at is a microgrid to Grid Island, the food distribution center, and also provide some energy to the community. Um, a quick question. You know the sidewalk produce guys who sell the, the produce? I'm just wondering, like, their prices are so much cheaper. Is there, like, a gradation of, like, produce, like bananas, like, ABC? Is there, like, a, like they buy, like, like 
produce that's older or somehow inferior or second Search. or something like that. And also, Trader Joe's, where is their produce? <laughs> <laughs> Do you like their produce? Uh, actually, I do like it. And it comes from us. <laughs> um, Tr Trader Joe's gets a lot of their product uh, direct from the farms. Um, most of the big supermarkets actually get, I'd say, probably up to 99% of their produce direct from the farms, uh, like we do. Um, they'll use companies like us as, we'll call it fill-ins. Maybe their truck's running late or the product arrives bad and they need an immediate fill-in from something they bought in California. So their next truck might not be there for a couple of days. So they'll use this as fill-ins for that. So I can't tell you exactly where Trader Joe's gets their produce, but I do know the majority of their stuff is going to come direct from the farm. Um, as for the sidewalk guys, uh, it could be a number of different things. So cheaper produce could mean they bought a marginal quality produce. Maybe you open up a box of apples and inside there's 100 apples and maybe 10 of them have start to go, have start to gone bad. So we're going to sell that. We can't sell that to the Whole Foods of the world, but we can sell that to a sidewalk vendor who might pull out those 10 bad ones. He got the box at a bargain price, so he'll sell the rest of the box for a better price. Um, it also does, it might not have to do with quality. It could have to do with supply. Um, I mentioned our business is supply and demand. Sometimes um, we'll get tons of supply in and we'll end up selling product that's perfectly good uh, for less than cost. So he might have uh, been able to take advantage of a deal like that. It also may have to do with refrigeration. Um, and you'll usually see the produce being sold at cheaper if they have a company, like whether it's like a you know, green grocer that doesn't have refrigeration or a sidewalk cart, they won't be paying for the refrigeration, so they don't pass that cost on to you. It means they have to turn it over more, but that's the trade-off. Hi. Is it on? All right, great. Um, so in the beginning, you guys were talking about the economies of scale and the competition and how that provides a lower cost for the consumer um, on our end when we you know, go to the grocery store and and um, we get the product. But can you talk a little bit more about how that affects the farmer, particularly the producers, the smaller producers um, within the region? And also, just I'm just curious where you guys are getting your stuff from and how you are working within the region. So sort of A and B questions. Thanks so much. Uh, um, when you talk about farmers, uh, we live in the state of New York, where the growing season obviously is shorter than in other states in the United States. We probably do about $100 million worth of business just with the New York State farmers. There may be some New Jersey in that statistic as well. And during the growing season, the Hunts Point Produce Market is the largest handler of product grown in the state of New York. So if you see in your supermarket New York State product, where Stephanie alluded to the fact that most of what Trader Joe's gets goes direct, uh, as Julie and I have spoken, and we're trying to show Julie other sides of the business. We have what we call shorts and longs. So let's take, for example, we have July 4th coming up, and hopefully it's going to be warm and sunny and everyone's going to be outside barbecuing. And all these major supermarkets have brought in trailer loads of corn that they cannot sell. They would use a market such as ours, where there is a number of, or the, where there are a number of different merchants that deal with these supermarkets on a regular basis for one reason or another. They would take that product in so it doesn't get wasted, it doesn't end up in the waste stream, and we would sell it for their account, we would make money, they would make money. As Stephanie also said, when you're in business, you need to make sure that everyone stays in business so that you have the supply necessary to sell to the consumer or the ultimate customer, if you will. So prices have to be reasonable on both ends. You have to be able to return enough money to the farmer so the farmer can continue to farm, whether it's a local farm, a regional farm, or a farm farther afield or outside the United States. We have to make enough profit, we meaning each individual merchant, so that the merchant can then pay the shipper. And we are, not that this is necessarily pertinent, but we function under something called a federal act called the Perishable Agricultural Commodities Act, put in place in 1932, where pay practices are very much in favor of making sure that the individual that sell, sends in the supply to you gets a return on his money in a timely basis. And I won't go into all the bells and whistles because it depends upon the relationship that you have. So we keep the farmer in business from season to season. We stay in business because you need to be really savvy 
but you need to make enough profit to cover your overhead, and has been stated here in a number of different ways. Uh, our markets are old. The cost of power is astronomical. Refrigeration is ancient and needs to be redone. We are doing upgraded lighting, both merchants on their own, we as a cooperative. But it's tough when it comes to economies of scale to cut back when the amount of capital needed is so exorbitant that if we didn't have EDC on one side of us and the merchant willing to put money into the business on the other side of us, staying in business would be difficult. So there needs to be money for maintaining your facility, paying your help, paying your farmer, and then at the end of the day, of course, putting money in your own pocket so that you can stay in business. I hope that answers your question. And from a meat market perspective, because I think it's important, the first thing that you have to understand is there's really no uh, USDA, we're USDA regulated, um, and we have USDA inspector that opens us up every day, closes us every day, and is uh, on, on, on site and on point in the market every day. But there really is no definition for locally raised, which is, I think, one of our problems. But um, I, I think that each, you know, each retailer will call it something different, 200 miles or 300 miles or whatever they choose. Um, for us, we raise our animals. We have uh, programs in Elba, Elba New York. Um, we have programs up... Um, uh, really m mostly, uh, you know, Northwest New York, um, and we also do local programs that, that are raised uh, uh, in Connecticut that go up to the New England area, and we just launched a new program. It's a Pennsylvania program for Whole Foods Mid-Atlantic, uh, so we, we try to focus on, on basically the Northeast, uh, and that we call our, our local regional programs that we'll then distribute out to our customers. But as far as uh, economies of scale are concerned, um, one, one of the functions that we were able to help with is that there's, there's uh, other customers besides Whole Foods that use these programs, but they might be able to use you know, three or four head of animals a, a week. And what we're able to do, so, so basically they, they are subject to only be, so you talk about economies of scale, they're subject to being able to sell, um, let's say uh, uh, three head, because they can only sell six ham. Right, and but maybe they could sell you know twenty shoulders, which is the other side of the animal. But because they can't sell the rest of the animal, um, which you need to do to make a profit, of course, uh, is you know they have to limit their local program. So we give them the ability to do because we do so much more in terms of volume. Is we can support them uh, and, and helping them to grow their local business without them having to take the entire animal, which they're just not capable of doing. So that's one of the things that we're pretty proud of, is that we're, we help to um, bring these local programs to scale. And, and I just want to mention, in addition to the local produce coming through the produce market, Balder is also doing a tremendous uh, in terms of their local program. Thanks. I just, we, we only have time for two more questions. We're a little over time. So uh, we have our two questions ready. Good afternoon. I have a two-pronged question. From a health perspective, can you tie in what Hunts Point is doing on that level? I know Ben said his mother is a nutritionist, and I kind of manage chronic diseases for this area. Um, and I have my students here, so I really want to tie in what Hunts Point is doing opposed to on a health perspective in chronic diseases, if you can. Um. Well, from a health perspective, uh, we are we have our food safety GIP GAP certification in the market. Um, I'm not sure about any of the other houses in the market because uh, that's an individual thing versus a whole market thing. But we do have our food safety certificate. Uh, we're going on year three now with that. And then from a uh, food nutritional point of view, I will say that uh, we we uh, we hit the schools. So we do um, as you saw in the video tours of students coming into the schools. We actually um, deliver produce um, on a weekly basis to several schools in the area. Um, we've had some programs set up with some schools actually even a little further away. Um, I did set up a field trip actually with some of the students who went down and visited some of the farms down in uh, South Jersey. So I think it's just getting them aware that there's fruits and vegetables out there that are good for them and introducing it to them now at a young age will teach them to eat it and cook with it later on in life. Uh, from a wellness perspective, uh, as far as we're concerned, well, number one, you know, Hunts Point uh, does, I believe, has have the, the highest rate of asthma 
in, in, in the U.S. Uh, from that residential perspective. And, you know, these are things that we're trying to, to you know, consider as, as we move forward. And, you know, Julie's a part of that, uh, of course. Um, from a wellness perspective in terms of the food, the industry's making a change. I mean, you see Subway and, and, and Papa John's and, you know, you know, even companies like that are now advertising, you know, a chicken raised without antibiotics. Uh, which is which is a big issue. Um, you know, our, our a lot of our proteins, which I mentioned earlier, are with our grass fed, grass finished, which are much higher in omega threes and sixes. Uh, high HDL, low LDL, which is you know basically good cholesterol is there, uh, not as much bad cholesterol. Um, so, you know, we we as a company believe in you know. Uh, you, animal welfare and producing a better product and a healthier product overall. Uh, but we definitely make the move to non-GMO project verified or organic certified. Um, so these are some of the things that, that we consider um, as part of our wellness brand uh, and, and movement going forward and, and current, of course. Thank you. We have, we have one, one last uh, question. We have a lot of questions, but we'll leave yeah. here. <laughs> For, um, for all the produce people. So the supermarkets in Harlem are very bad at labeling uh, their produce products, whether they're organic or non-GMO or you know, conventionally raised, you know, all the things that Whole Foods does. Um, do, does produce come into the market labeled so it's deliberate um, malfeasance on the part of the supermarket <laughs> owners in like central that. Harlem and northern Manhattan? Um, it depends upon which labeling you're talking about. Um, I can't speak for what the supermarket does, but I can tell you that, to my knowledge, the only required labeling on produce is country of origin. Uh, back in 2012, they put that into place, and it's uh, where the product is actually grown from has to be displayed. As far as non-GMO and other things of that nature, I don't believe it's required. Um, so if it has it on it, I don't know if they're removing it or not. Um, it's, we get produce from all different all different farms that comes in all different ways, so it'll kind of be some do, some don't. I would just say from a marketing perspective, if they're buying that produce, they're going to be marketing it. If they're not buying it, they're not going to market it. Um, and also that if you want them to, you know, it's the old rule of thumb that, you know, you have to ask like 20 times before a store might consider it, but just build a, um, a system of encouraging the stores that that's what you want to buy. Ultimately, the customer votes with their dollars. Is is, is what she's saying. Um, so if you if you want it, you know, you just have to consider, you know, that you, you know you, you guys make that decision ultimately with where you're shopping and what you're paying for. Thank you. I know there's a lot of a lot more questions. Maybe some of the panelists will stay after. I want to thank you know Julie, Myra, Kate, and Ben and Stephanie for for coming today. We're all very busy. market as I'm sure many of you have. Um, just a couple of quick announcements. The next New York City Food Policy for Breakfast Seminar will be on August 30th and we will welcome the co-founder and editor-in-chief of Civil Eats, Naomi Starkman. Um, please make sure to check out our website, a little uh, prop for nycfoodpolicy.org. We have weekly articles that are constantly being you know, posted and our New York City Food Policy Watch, um, which it has a digest that's uh, every, done every every week. Um, and have a wonderful 4th of July, and we'll see you at the end of August. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you for